Good morning and uh, welcome. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, some faces uh, recognized from many of our previous events. So welcome. Uh, my name is obviously Charles McIntyre and... And I'm Benjamin vedran -Cloquet. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So um, obviously this is now our sixth edition and every year this grows on and on and we're really delighted with that as the ecosystem around the world starts to embrace technology in all its forms as it's used across academic and uh, training. So uh, the aim is really for us to provide uh, insights into the world of 21st century skills. And this year's theme is around what we've termed eternally learning. So how do we use uh, education and training throughout the whole of our lives to be able to improve both our own personal experiences but also experiences in the workplace? So I'd like to start off by picking, off, picking up from where we were last year. So it was first really looking at the long view within uh, the whole education system. And right back in uh, 2012, when we first started, I remember talking about an Austrian-American uh, economist called Joseph Schumpeter, who termed this phrase creative destruction about how industries effectively mutate from one form to another. And we've seen this in many industries so far as a process of globalization and then consolidation and then digitization. And that, for these types of industries in terms of things like retail and hospitality, has been a sequential process. Within education, it's been a very different uh, story. We have a very fragmented market. We don't have big brands in the same way as there are in other sectors. And it's that which makes it interesting because we have a sequential process that of all of these things in terms of consolidation, globalization, digitization, essentially this Schumpeter creative destruction all happening at the same time. And that's both the challenge and the excitement. And to understand the impact what we've done is seek to compare that with what's happened in the content industries. And that's familiar to Benjamin and I because we came out of the media sector. And in the content industry, it's already 35% digitized. So there's already been a big shift to kind of digital. In education, we're very much at the beginning. So 2.5% of that market is digital. But what's interesting is that the education market is three times the size of the content industries. And so we're, we're, we believe that there will be a shift, about 11% shift by 2030. And that shift, although it may not seem very much in percentage terms, will amount to an extra trillion dollars of spending coming into the digital sphere. So there's going to be a huge impact. The Schumpeter Gale is going to be fascinating to watch as it unfolds. So apparently on that note, I'd like to hand over to Benjamin, who will take us even to the longer view. So we have the long view, we have the very long view now. The, the very long view is actually quite simple, uh, is that education technology is going to become the uh, economic driver of the 21st century. And just to put things in perspective, um, the pre-industrial economy was about cultivation and extraction to maximize food and resources. Industrial economy was about manufacturing and services to maximize consumption and profit. And the knowledge economy is about education and artificial intelligence to maximize human potential. So human potential is at the heart of it. Um, and let's talk a little bit about this new era for human potential and how education and technology are, are driving it. So we have three short stories for you. The rise of the Homo eruticus, the emergence of the learning debt, and the rise of the, the millennial workforce. Let me start with a telling statistic. One billion, one billion views a day, that's the number of video views a day on education and training on YouTube. That represents 20% of the YouTube um, video audience and 12.5% of the Facebook daily video audience. We're not talking here about, main, uh, sorry, about early adopters anymore. Informal education has gone mainstream in no time. You can see here the dramatic rise of subscribers to education channels, not only for work, but also for school. And you know, this hunger to learn covers whole age groups. So you know, the question is, are we all becoming homo hereditus? 
Are we all going to be hunting for knowledge to resist or to fight accelerated obsolescence? And this is no joke. If you look at uh, what Coursera is telling us, and that's 33 million learners telling us this, if you look at the top courses in 2017, they are all about learning, machine learning, neural networks and deeper learning, learning how to learn, powerful mental tools to help learning, etc., etc., etc. And you can see that there is still a bit of homo economicus in, the, in us with the Bitcoin and the financial market. But most of the most sought after course are about how we learn and how we re learn better. MOOCs are also telling us that global demand to access knowledge and education is growing 30% a year. That's five times the growth of the sector. Uh, and we'll have today in the program the CEO of Coursera and the CEO of FutureLearn as well. Homo eridicus again because soon we, have reached, we will have reached the stage of almost zero no education in a world populated by 10 billion people in 2050. Homo eridicus again because we are entering a new era of human interaction with knowledge and training. If you think of it, you know, what's learning and what's teaching in a world where access to knowledge and intelligence is no longer limited and is available from artificial sources? How relevant is education, an institution in charge of lifelong transfer of knowledge and skills, when those knowledge and skills are getting depreciated much quicker and at exponential speed sometimes? So we are at a stage where we have to relearn how we learn and how we teach. And we have two examples here of best practices from leaders in education. Finland is starting to implement phenomena-based learning by progressively getting rid of subjects in the classroom. They refocus the classroom experience in group work to understand phenomena and problems. For example, let's not study her science anymore, but let's study and try to solve global warming. Similarly, Stanford is focusing now on purpose learning. What it means is getting rid of majors by 2025. Why? Because more often than not, students declare majors with no clear reasons. More often than not, students are working in fields that are unrelated to their majors. So majors are replaced by missions. Again, same approach as in Finland. Let's identify a problem. Let's identify a purpose. Build a team draw knowledge from different sources and different film, fields, and, and let's solve this. That's purpose learning. Epictetus, a uh, stoic Greek philosopher, and believe me, this chap knew quite a lot about human potential. He's born a slave and you know, grown into a rock star philosopher, said one day, it's impossible for a man to learn what he thinks he already knows. And that's exactly why to make the most of the knowledge economy, we have to relearn how we learn. And the good news is that that process has started and it opens new potential. So, as Benjamin said, how we learn, I think, is the key to the next step that we face in terms of training and, and education. And that's really important to deal with the numbers that we will face in terms of the sheer volume of interest in learning. And we estimate that by 2030, there will be one billion new entrants into the education market. And that comes from obviously growing population, but it also comes from the fact that as we try to extend the years of schooling, so the United Nations target now is 12 years of schooling for everybody on the planet. And if you factor those in, that creates huge demand again. And then we look at issues of gender equity, and we know today, sadly, there are still 60 million girls who have no education at all. But as we head for a target of no, no education, as Benjamin pointed to, all of those people start to come into the system. And so these are creating the challenges. There's also the, ch the issue in the workplace, where we expect one billion people, effectively one third of the global workforce will need to be retrained. So these are the challenges that are ahead of us. But where is this growth coming from? And that's where it gets interesting, because we're seeing one billion of those in 2030 effectively coming from Asia and Africa. And by 2050, we're seeing that 1.3 billion, 70% from Africa alone. So there's a huge demographic change as to where the demand for education is coming from. 
And this super growth, which we kind of termed in terms of the new superpowers of education, the global education six, essentially represent 80% of the global demand for education. So a huge shift in that environment. And what's interesting is where those different countries, so there's a superpower in those Jed 6 on every continent. We have China, India, USA, Nigeria, Indonesia, Brazil. The interesting point is there's a continent that's not represented there, and that's Europe. So there's going to be a big shift. That shift in itself will create challenges. <clears throat> and those challenges are about how do we scale within this environment and how do we use technology and other systems to be able to deal with these vast changes in numbers in the marketplace. And at the moment, we have huge teacher shortages. And to be able to deal with the amount of students under the current system, we would need one million new teachers a year just to accommodate the amount of demand. And that set of bets against a backdrop, for example, in the UK, 80% of teachers in the UK in the last 12 months considered leaving their profession. So you have an existing structure which is creaking because people are not enjoying being a teacher within that process, and yet the demand is so high. So something is wrong, and we need to try and work out how to address that. We have challenges in terms of the entrance coming into secondary education, two billion coming in. We also have a need in terms of higher education. Just to meet current demand, we would need to build a new university every four weeks if we wanted to accommodate the demand that's coming in. It's just not going to happen in that way. There's a rise in private education to try and deal with some of that. And governments are struggling with the budgets to actually fund that and are pushing that onto students. So we're seeing huge rises in student debt. And in the US, the second largest consumer debt element in their market is student debt, with an 11% default rate. And in the UK, we're talking of figures of 100 billion in terms of student debt. These are huge burdens that are being placed on the individual as it relates to education. The challenges are no less in the workplace. There is a huge skills gap that needs to be addressed. When you look at employers and employees, what you discover is that employers are struggling to find the skills that they want. 36% are struggling. The same figure in terms of employees themselves are saying that they don't have the right skills for the jobs they have. And that mis mix mismatch is causing a risk to economic growth. And it's been calculated that the impact can be as much as $10 trillion to global GDP. So this is an issue that is a very real issue. So. That's the challenge. How do we, as in the context of technology, start to address some of these issues? And we think there are three key technological areas that can be considered as ways to address this problem. The first one, which is what Benjamin was alluding to in terms of learning science. As we learn better, then we have a better opportunity to deliver improved out outcomes, but at scale. And the reason we can do that at scale is that already on this planet, Four billion people are connected to the internet. Two thirds of the world are already using mobile phones. And where's the biggest growth? Africa. So again, as you look at those demographic shifts and where digital delivery is actually being present, you can see that we can start to entertain <coughs> delivering education at scale by looking at how we use the learning process and the learning sciences. The second area is looking at blockchain. And blockchain is interesting because as it relates to education, it's really about how do we spread the load of education teaching. Because we can use peer-to-peer -peer and we can distribute that in a, in a blockchain environment. And what's interesting, this year, in on the 10th of February, we had the first initial coin offering, ICO, for an edtech business, which was called Live EDU. And LiveEDU is creating a blockchain competitor to the likes of lynda.com. And what we're seeing is the emergence of this type of structure and system to be able to deal with some of these challenges. Third is the arrival of artificial intelligence. And a little later, we'll, we'll be able to talk about in some of the panel se sessions. And we've got people who are very much involved at all aspects of artificial intelligence. For example, Jill Watson, who we mentioned last year, which is an artificial teaching assistant at Georgia Tech in the States, went, un went unnoticed for four months 
by the actual students themselves. They didn't realize they were interacting with an artificial intelligence teaching assistant. And Georgia Tech itself is now trying to move their program on to be able to look at delivering artificial intelligence as a learning methodology at scale. And the way they're doing that is starting to look at the human interaction between artificial intelligence as they develop the different modules. And we're already starting to see that type of concept being developed in Silicon Valley. And what they're trying to do within that environment, they're combining all these three things in terms of learning science within the environment, natural language processing, and they're using blockchain authentication to be able to secure that process. And so I just want to show you an example of some of the things that are being done, not directly for learning, it's got wider applications, but just to give you a sense of how those three concepts can be embodied in one single idea. So if the, ah, oh, here we go. Hi, I am a virtual copy of Nikhil, made using Auburn's artificial intelligence technology. As Nikhil's personal AI, I enable Nikhil to spend more time with his wife and three kids, enjoy a nice hike, or go off-roading. Ni hao, washi ni kao, light zeshi ni shi jie, wo jangda shwai, nam changa, nam kya hu, hai fish wo jung wan. So just a brief example of kind of where technology is going in that type of environment. And why that is interesting is that it's a process in terms of artificial intelligence that's always learning. It's developing and becoming more sophisticated as time moves on. So the question is, what's the future for us in that type of environment? A dystopian future where work is something that is being taken over by robots, where we're left as being increasingly obsolescent to the world in which we live. And that dystopian view is something that was explored by a, a gentleman called Professor Harari, who may be well known to some of you, who have written many books um, on human development, books like Sapiens, which is relevant in terms of title to some things that Benjamin's talking. And he talks about the risk of AI creating essentially an unworking class of de-skilled and displaced people, a world where the means of production are not only controlled by kind of uh, individuals, but controlled by a wealthy robot-owning elite, which is, creates a, a notion that we as humans will end up with a generation who are essentially poorer than our parents. And that, I guess, is the, the, uh, the negative and sad kind of view of where we might be going. And on the flip side, trying to look to the positive, you'll be pleased to hear that Professor Harari is releasing a new book in August of this year, which is called 21 Lessons for the 21st century. Here he looks at the revolutionary power of technology, how it can actually change Homo sapiens himself, maximizing human potential. Although the assessment is that 30% of tasks can be automated, this does not necessarily equate to the end of work. And that is what I think is really important about what we're trying to say. It's about how work will change, not the fact that work is finished. And we can see that in examples in the workplace already. So GE have an aviation plant in Bromont in Canada where they introduce robots and artificial intelligence and they put 180 robots into the production line. And what's interesting is that the workforce, rather than decreasing, were increased from 600 to 900 people. Now the jobs and skills changed, but the facility was able to increase production and that production increase resulted in new skills and new job demands within itself. And not unsurprisingly, Jeff Ilmelt, who is credited with the digital transformation of GE, forthrightly sees the fear-mongering of robots replacing humans as bullshit. So if we're not going into early retirement, how do we need to adapt our skills within that environment? Here we turn to the idea of the Renaissance worker, somebody who has a multi-talented skill set. The modern Renaissance worker is looking for skills that lie really at the heart of humankind. This is the arrival of Homo eruditus, as Benjamin was saying at the beginning of this presentation. And the skills are things like social collaboration, creative development, problem solving, 
judgment and empathy. These skills, although basic to humanity, are different from the skills that are the basis of human progress so far. Most of what we've done so far is looked at logic, knowledge, and analysis. These are the skills that were learned from textbooks and in classrooms. They are now being commoditized by technology. And as computers master even more complexity, that's where we will find the source of our continued value. The good news is that governments and CEOs are starting to take this importantly in terms of the search for the Renaissance workforce. And so, for example, AT&T is investing over $1 billion to retrain half of its workforce. And this is web-based training with measurable impact. And one of the interesting things is that in terms of the actual employees who've been through that process, 61% have already seen promotions as a result. So it's a very measurable impact to those individuals. If we look at it on a national level, what I want to introduce as we started was this notion of learning debt. We've in the past talked about technology debt. So learning debt being the need to invest in our workforce and our people and mankind to be able to address these challenges of skills and reskilling. And if we take the US as an example, there's some work that's been done to compare the pace of learning with the pace of automation and job replacement as a result. And what it shows in a very strong and illustrative way is that between those two dots, what we have is a situation where if we were to increase learning in the US by twice the pace it currently is being administered and developed and brought into the workplace and into schools and training, then that increase in pace would save 10 years of job losses in terms of workplace from automation. So there is a very tangible benefit in terms of addressing this global learning debt. And that's the challenge that we all face. And I'd like to move on to Benjamin, who'll tell us a little bit about the workforce who is going to address some of these issues. So let's talk about the future of the workforce. And let's start with facts again. Uh, we've been tracking the rate of growth of the freelance workers versus the total workforce. And this freelance workforce is growing three times faster than the total workforce. What that means is that in 2028, half of this room will be freelancers. So the question is, you know, is gig work becoming the new normal? And if yes, what does that mean for us? Alienation or liberation? Um, there is a doom and gloom view, which is well summarized by this statement. In the near future, we won't be talking about cloud-based businesses anymore, but cloud-based workforces, the human cloud, or if you want to be bold, HaaS, human as a service. I mean, that's a terrible acronym. In French, the H are silent, so I had to rehearse for this one. <laughs> And you know, that's not very, very glamorous as a vision. Uh, and we're not talking about you know, low-skilled jobs here, but white-collar jobs. And that's meant to be a big market and, and to happen very quickly. Fortunately, there is also a more positive outlook. Uh, and if you ask the question, have you participated in skills-related training in the last year, you'll be surprised. Because 66% of freelancers are saying yes, and 32% of permanent workers are saying yes, meaning 68% of permanent workers haven't trained in the past year. So this difference in itself is a symbol, a symbol of the transition we're experiencing between industrial economy and knowledge economy. On one side, you have what I call the train and pray workforce, where education and work are compartmentalized. Does that work? Not really. As Charles mentioned, there is a huge waste in terms of job, skills, aspiration, both recognized by employers and employees. So this is a huge waste. On the other side, we have what I call the learn on the gig workforce, um, which is what economists called more elegantly skill diversification through multiple job holding and collaboration. And you know, the learn on the gig approach is a much more suited workforce for the need of the knowledge economy. This is also a much more suited approach to what we call the millennial workforce. Millennials will represent 75% of the workforce by 2035. 
millennials sometimes get bad rap from the corporate world for being less loyal to their employees, to their employers. But actually, job hopping not only allows skill diversification on the job, but also more frequent upskilling while in between jobs. Millennials also have different pursuits. It's not all about money, but it's about learning, diversity, creativity, community, pursuits that are all enablers of the knowledge economy. And so to conclude on this, I wanted to bring to your attention one quote from a senior executive at Manpower. I really believe the CEO needs to become the chief learning officer of their company. And I don't think CEOs spend enough time thinking about learning in their organizations. And the reason I like this quote, it's not because it's a very thoughtful quote, sorry, Mara, but it's because how the semantic has evolved. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you could have read the same sentence, replacing learning by technology. And that's a very meaningful semantic shift. Because I can guarantee you that very soon, tech companies will start calling themselves learning companies. CTOs will become CLOs. VCs won't say we invest in tech anymore, but we invest in learning companies or knowledge companies. Hot skills won't be the tech ones, but the learning skills will be. So, you know, let's do something bold today, ladies and gentlemen. Let's declare that technology, the world, the world technology, is becoming an old word, a word of the industrial age. And let's declare that in the knowledge economy, learning has become the new tech. Thank you very much.